the throne, singing songs of worship to the Lord alone. As they cried, holy, holy, the heavens filled with glory, but they had to step aside when they heard a song arise. It made the Father smile to see his child step forth and start to see. When a sinner felt his grace, and the saints and angels did rejoice when that child began to lift his voice, he said, I'm redeemed, I am redeemed, the greatest song this mortal tongue can sing. Wash all my 
sins away. Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. When this poor lisping stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Thank you, fellas, for that. Appreciate that. Go and take your Bibles, if you would. Go to the book of Jonah tonight. The book of Jonah. And go ahead and go to chapter number one to start off with. I will probably not say anything new to you this evening, <clears throat> and that's usually a good thing. Those who are giving new doctrine, that's usually a warning sign. Uh, so, but just a reminder of some things tonight for us and um, want to be an encouragement to you. Jonah chapter 1, we'll begin reading at verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going down to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Father, help us tonight as we consider this very familiar text. And Lord, oftentimes the danger of looking at a familiar text is, is that we miss or the message you have for us at the present. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us not to miss what you have in store for us tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah is one of the most familiar stories we have in our Bibles. Next to David and Goliath, it's probably one of the uh, top five stories. That if you were to talk to somebody out on the street and you would say, name me uh, your uh, most familiar Bible stories, that is very likely that Jonah's story would come up. Uh, we've heard it since we were in uh, probably even the nursery, uh, whenever the nursery worker, workers were in there and they were trying to keep us occupied for those extra things. 30 minutes that the pastor kept going on and on for, and they would bring out the stories and they would try to keep us busy. We probably have heard this story since that time, and we know the story well. I want us to consider some things tonight, and I really want to get to the end of the sermon. I'm sure you do as well. Uh, but I want to use everything to build up to the very end tonight. That's where we're going. And so we're going to say a lot of familiar things. But don't let the familiar keep you from hearing the, from the voice of the Lord. Um, it is the familiar sometimes that he wants to use because we know what is coming, but don't anticipate it. Don't get ahead of the story. God had a need and he had a message that he wanted to give to a people who were in great need. The people of Nineveh were not nice people. The people of Nineveh were not people that you would want to live next door to. In fact, you would not want to be a neighboring country to these people because not only did they come in and try to, de to defeat you, they were very vicious. 
in the way they treated their enemies, those people they were attacking. And because of that, it wasn't just the Israelites, but it was every nation uh, in existence in that day had a very um, strong and deep hatred for these people. They did not like them. They didn't want anything to do with them. In fact, they were, would have been happy if God would have wiped them off the face of the earth. And the message was just that. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And if you will, I can't help but think it, think it is, does not say it in Scripture, but I cannot help but think that Jonah thought, good. They deserve it. But that is not the message that God was sending Jonah to go and give. Instead, he had a message for him to go. And the Bible says in verse 2, the message was simply this, to go to that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. I want you to go and tell them that you are in bad trouble because of your wickedness and God's judgment is hanging over your head. But Jonah knew that if he were to tell the message of God to them, there was a chance, slight as it may be, there was a chance that they would actually get right with God. And because Moses knew the character of God, he knew God was a God of, of mercy, he said, it would be just my luck that I would be the one responsible for bringing revival to this place, and I don't want my name being attached to such things. That's the attitude. And so what did Jonah do? I want you to understand there are several things that Jonah knew. First off, Jonah knew what God's will was for him, but he ran from it. He ran from the, uh, from the will of God. As soon as he knew what God wanted him to do, verse 3, the Bible says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Where did God tell him to go? Nineveh. Nineveh is not the same as Tarshish. It is not a different name for Nineveh. It is a different place. In fact, it is 180 degrees opposite direction of where uh, Nineveh was at. But that's where the Bible says Jonah didn't just uh, go uh, sauntering down there. He didn't just take a leisurely walk that way. He, the Bible says he rose up and fled. That means he got his things together and he traveled as fast as he could. He was running from the will of God. Not only that, we find this as well, that he goes and he, uh, he, he gets down to that place there in verse 3, he rolls up to flee in a Tarshish. Not only was he running from God's will, but he was running from God's presence as well. He, to run from the Lord, as if there is a place on this earth you could go and not be where God was at. But it was his heart it was his heart intent to run from the place that God had put them in. You think about this here, uh, that Adam and Eve had that same thought. Well, we can go into the garden and we can hide uh, our, ourselves away. No, uh, that wasn't a possibility. God knew exactly uh, where they were at when Cain was confronted. Uh, and they was asked, uh, where is your brother at? It's not that God didn't know. He knew exactly where he was at. Uh, but we have this idea sometimes that uh, I can go and do some things. I can get away from things. And God won't, uh, won't, won't be there. Now, He's anywhere you go. See, if you're saved in here tonight, you're His child tonight, there is nowhere you can go that God's presence will not be with you. The Holy Spirit goes wherever you go because He indwells you. And even as an unbeliever, there's no place an unbeliever can go that God is not present. Psalm 139, David talks about that. doesn't matter where he went, God was going to be present there. David desired to be in the presence of the Lord, but Jonah here had a desire to run away from God. And, and as you read through this, it's interesting as you read uh, about Jonah here, you find a certain direction that Jonah kept going, don't you? Jonah constantly was going down, always going down. Look again there in verse number three that he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And, and when they went to go and try to find him, they found that he had went down into the sides of the ship. Jonah's direction was constantly down. And I understand that, uh, that this isn't necessarily talking about his, his going down, and spiritually speaking, but it definitely was a metaphor for what was happening spiritually with him. He was going down. Anytime you run from the presence of the Lord, there is only one direction to go. You're going to go down. And you're going to go down. 
and you're going to go down. And that's exactly what Jonah was doing, constantly going down the whole time. Not only that, we find here that God wanted uh, Jonah to go to Nineveh. And I believe as long as Jonah would have been in the will of God, doing what God would want him to do, that God would take care of everything for him and get him there. Just like he took care of, of Brother Ryan and taking care of that expense that he had with his vehicle, I believe God was going to take care of everything for Jonah if he just obeyed his will. But Jonah did not. Instead, Jonah went on his own, and he ended up doing what? He ended up paying for everything himself. God will not support you in your rebellion against him. God will not support you. He will not provide for you as you run away from him. Uh, God will let you uh, ruin yourself just like that prodigal son uh, ran and he wasted all of his living. When we're running from God, that's exactly what we do. We waste everything that God has given to us. He had to pay the fare himself. There's a pay a price to go through the storm as well. The Bible says that as they were on that ship and they were dealing with all of the, uh, the, the, the terrible storm, they began to unload all the wares of the ship. See, Jonah wasn't the only one paying for his sin. Jonah wasn't the only one paying for his sin. The, the, the mariners who were carrying him along the way were also paying for his sin. They did not know that Jonah was in rebellion against God, but they were getting hit. You see, you, you have no idea. You think, well, this is only going to affect me. That's a lie of the devil. Sin never only affects you. Sin always sends out ripples. And sin always uh, catches people that are, uh, that are innocent, if you will, innocent bystanders. God, it's amazing how sin will, 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 will catch, you, catch those folks and, and hurt them as well. Understand that the boat that Jonah decided to get into, he affected all those people because of the choices he was making. Jonah had to endure difficulties because of his running. There was a storm. Nothing more frightening to me than to be in a, in a boat in the middle of a storm. There are certain things that, um, you know, I know we all must die, but there are certain things I ask the Lord, please don't let it be this. One of them is drowning. I have a severe fear of not being able to breathe. I don't know if you have that same fear or not, but I do. And that's one of those things, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, if, if there's a, uh, you know, a documentary or something like that comes up and they show somebody, you know, is going down and they're going to die in a vessel underwater and they're, they're going to run out of air. I don't watch it. I skip it. <laughs> don't want to see that. Don't want to see that. OK, I don't know what it is, but I just the inability to breathe is just is, is frightening to me. Here's Jonah as he's going through this great storm that there's a potential, there's going to be great, uh, great devastation uh, uh, because of what is going on. Uh, sometimes we're not even aware of those storms going on in our lives. You read verse 5, see what verse 5 says there. The mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship and in the sea to lighten uh, of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. I mean, it's like, you know, whenever we have these big storms come through from time to time, I don't sleep through storms. I wake up, I know everything going on. Heather, oh, there was a storm last night? What is wrong with you? Well, I figured you'd be up, so it doesn't matter, you know, right? <laughs> But that's where Jonah was. He was sleeping right through the storm. Everybody else is panicking. Reminds me of the disciples, Master, carest thou not that we perish? See, Jonah was asleep and was totally unaware of the things going on outside of him. Hey, you know, it's amazing too. In verse 6, the Bible shows this here. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Wake up. Don't you realize what's going on? Uh, uh, cry out to your God, and, and, and if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And, and they cast lots, and they find out that Jonah is the reason for these things. And verse 8, they say, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? They begin asking questions. You're the only one not worried about this thing. Something's up. And Jonah begins to, if you will, spill the beans. I'm a Hebrew. 
And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. That put the fear of the Lord into these men's heart. But here he is, hey, what are you doing? Don't you see what you're, what's going on? And, and because of those things, he said, look, here's, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to throw me overboard. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. It's amazing that these heathen people had such respect for life, isn't it? Yeah. We don't want to do that. But they, 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 they got to the point where they had nothing else to do. So before they do it, they cry out to the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness. Verse 15, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. That was the answer. And of course we know what took place. A great fish swallowed Jonah up there in verse 17. Three days and three nights. There he is in the bottom of the ocean, of the, of the sea and the belly of a well, and you would think that would be enough to turn a man around, wouldn't you? We know the story in Jonah chapter 2 that he prays and God causes the, uh, the fish to have a, a great indigestion after three days, and he puts them back out onto dry land uh, in a very forceful manner. The Bible tells in chapter number 3 that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And he went and he did what God told him the second time. And he goes and he preaches and he does these things here. And the Bible tells us in verse 5 that the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast to put sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. They go through all of these things. They do everything to get right with the Lord. And in verse number 1 of chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry. Jonah had changed his direction physically, but it did not change spiritually. And see, that's, that's, the big, that's the big thing tonight for us to get. You can be here in body, but not be here in spirit. You can be here physically, but in your heart of hearts and in your mind, you are somewhere else tonight, and you're out living some other life. Tonight, we've got to guard against allowing ourselves to be taken by this world and drawn away from the things of God. I want us to consider these things here just for a moment, and I want us to ask ourselves this here tonight. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Jonah preached a message. He preached a sermon that day. The Bible says that he got out there in verse number 2, and he went through the city, and he got, uh, he said, got the message, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. There's much speculation about this, uh, whether it took three days to cross it or it took three days to get there. It doesn't really matter for us right now. But understand here in verse 4 that Jonah began to enter into a city, the, the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's as if he would walk in like uh, here into Piedmont and he would walk down to Kenny's corner and stand there and say, hey, God's going to burn this place down. That's it. Do, do you see any hope here of where he says, now if, you, if you'll turn to the Lord, uh, he'll have mercy upon you. That's not what he says, does it? it does he? Yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And he leaves. What kind of heart for a sermon does this man have? If all I did was stand up here and say, hey, the Bible says you're all going to burn in the lake of fire. And leave. Like, well, okay. What do we do? There's no instruction whatsoever of what to, what to do to remedy this. Jonah's hope was that they would all be destroyed and burn in a devil's hell. You talk about a man with no heart. You talk about a man who did not care. That's Jonah. 
And listen, God is not looking for people to come and just simply go through and do the motions and to do the, uh, well, this is what it says, so do this and do this and do this and then walk out. And you have no heart for the things of God. We can stand up and we can, uh, we can teach a Sunday school lesson and have no heart for God. Have no heart for the people. We can go run a bus route and we can put the time in and say, well, you know, God told us to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, so I guess so I'll, I'll go do that. That way God will stay off my case. That way God won't throw me in the ocean and have some fish come by and swallow me up. I don't want that, so. All right, fine, I'll go do what you want me to do. But there was no heart. You understand that Christianity and being a believer is more than just the <clears throat> outward doing. <coughs> there are many who have tried to make Christianity exactly that. Well, as long as you do these certain things, it doesn't matter what you do the rest of the week. As long as you show up for confession, you can do whatever you want. As long as you say a few Hail Marys, pray to a few saints, you'll be fine. Count some rosary beads. God doesn't say that. That's not His Word. God's looking for us. He wants to know what is your heart. What is your heart? Do you have a heart for the things of God? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul, as he's writing to the people of Corinth, he talks about those things that motivate us uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to serve the Lord. There, there are those who are motivated by uh, getting out of this body and one day having a brand new body, and so we're motivated by heaven. And so we do what we do because we're, we have a hope of heaven. Some are motivated by the judgment seat of Christ because they know that, that, that one day all their work's going to be put through the fire. But, but Paul, uh, in verse, I believe it's verse 14, says, but the love of Christ constraineth us. See, there's a love for God that constrains us to have a desire to, uh, to serve the Lord and to do what He'd have us to do. And we have a heart for the things of God. We have a heart to serve the Lord. We have a heart to be involved in what God would have us to be involved in. Uh, we don't, uh, the Bible talks there in 2 Corinthians 9 about being a cheerful giver. The idea there is to have our heart into our giving. Uh, the Bible tells us, I believe it's in uh, uh, later in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I think that's where it's at. It says that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. To have our hearts into these things. See, the problem with Jonah was not his message. The problem with Jonah was not his action. The problem with Jonah was he had no heart for the things of God. He said, well, what's the big deal? He accomplished what God sent him out for. It's a very big deal because something happens to Jonah. Something happens to Jonah. I want you to see this in verse number 1 again in chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Who was Jonah angry with? <coughs> You ever ask yourself that question? Who's Jonah angry with? He's angry at God. Because God didn't do things His way. See, see we have a problem in, in America in that we think that God is supposed to jump for us. And at a snap of our fingers, He's supposed to do whatever we ask Him to do. And we are supposed to get our will done, not His will done. The problem is, is we have no heart for God. There's no heart for God. And listen, Jonah uh, here, even though uh, as, as best as we can tell, Jonah is, uh, is the preacher that was, uh, was responsible for delivering the message that would bring about the greatest revival, if you will, of the Bible there was no heart, and I believe there was no reward for Jonah in all of this. Because he lacked a heart for God. He was angry at God. He got angry because God didn't do what he wanted him to do. But even more than that, notice there in verse uh, uh, 2, he prayed in the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before in a Tarshish, for I knew, here it is, that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord 
Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Jonah, are you right to be angry that I was merciful and I was gracious to somebody? Jonah, am I, was I right? Are you, are you serious, Jonah? Are, 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 do you think you're right for being angry at me because I showed mercy and grace to people that needed my mercy and grace? You think you're, you think you're, you're justified in your actions, Jonah? What a question for Jonah. And what a question for us when we don't get our way and we don't get things. Well, God, I feel like you should just, you should strike them down. We get angry because somebody receives grace. We get angry because somebody receives mercy. How in the world is that possible? It's possible when we have no heart. See, when our hearts are hardened, we don't care. All we want to make sure is that they get what is coming to them. Well, what, a, what a terrible, terrible mindset for Jonah to have. But listen, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we watch uh, uh, people uh, uh, come and, 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 and say they're going to do this, and then they, they fall back into things, and they keep messing up, and they keep messing up, and they keep messing up, or they keep hurting us. And then we say, God, don't give them another chance because I'm not going to give them another chance. When Peter asked the Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times. You ever have somebody do something to you over and over and over again? I mean, they, 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 they do it and they say, oh, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And they turn around and do it again. You want to say, you're a liar. You're a liar. I remember there, we were at camp uh, one year, and I was, uh, uh, we, were, we were getting everybody situated and everything like this here, and, uh, and I was talking to somebody who had just come in, and, and I wasn't really paying attention. I was trying to talk. You ever try to talk to somebody and walk backwards? It's not a good idea. Here I was, I was, I was walking up the aisle, and I accidentally bumped into somebody who was sitting down because I was distracted over here. And, I, and as soon as I did, I, I didn't have any clue who it was. I turned around and I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. Uh, I wasn't paying attention, didn't see you there. And I remember the guy looked up and says, no, you're not. <laughs> hmm. Well, listen, I am, whether you believe me or not, but <laughs> anyway... I just carried on because what do you say to that? There's nothing to be said to that because you're like, well, okay. Um, you know, and if we're not careful, and I don't know, maybe somebody else bumped into him earlier. I don't know what happened, but for some reason he was already said that nobody's really sorry. Nobody's really ever trying to do this to me on purpose. No, we're not. But boy, it sure feels like when you just have the same thing happen over and over and over again. That's where Jonah was at because the Ninevites kept doing things over and over again. And so he had had enough and he was ready for God to judge them. But God said, I'm still going to show mercy. Peter, I want you to forgive and extend mercy 70 times 7. I'm going to need a bigger book. No, you're not. You can throw the book out. See, see there's, there was a lack of heart from Jonah, and I believe the hardness of his heart was there because he kept hearing that they deserve this, they deserve this, they deserve this, they deserve this. God get him. I hope God burns him down. I hope God destroys him. I hope God gets him. And then God did not. Because God heard their cry for mercy. And the Bible says, Jonah says, I knew it. I knew it. I've watched you be gracious, and I've watched you be merciful, and I've watched you be slow to anger. And I knew that's exactly why you were going to, you were going to do to them. That's why I didn't want to preach to those people. Jonah, that makes no sense. Because the very reason we proclaim the Word of God is because we want people to turn to God. That's why we do it. But that's not why Jonah was doing it. He was just trying to avoid a whale. Are you doing what you do just so you can avoid God's anger? Or are you doing it because there's a heart for God? 
You know, in Jonah's anger, notice what else happens to him in verse 9. Uh, verses uh, 5 on down through, we're told that Bible that Jonah goes out, builds a booth because the sun was hot upon him uh, there, and God made a gourd grow up over him. And boy, he was rejoicing in the gourd, and then he sent a worm there overnight, and he, the worm ate that gourd up, and so, so the gourd withered away, and so the hot wind was blowing on him, and the sun was beating down upon him. And the Bible says uh, that Jonah uh, begins to have that same attitude again. It is better for me to die than to live. And notice in verse 9, God asks a question. God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Jonah was so filled with rage over the gourd, a petty thing. It's a little thing, especially in comparison to the souls that were being transformed there in Nineveh. A small thing, but that's what happens when our heart grows cold towards God and His, His love for us and His love for others. All of a sudden, little things make us angry. You ever notice that? The colder we get, the harder we get towards the Lord, the more we resent every little thing. You hear somebody will say this here, it's not a big deal. Oh, it's a big deal, all right. No, really, it's not. But what we're doing is we're revealing our heart, that our heart has grown cold, our heart has grown hard. Our heart no longer beats in tune, in, uh, in symphony, if you will, with the heart of our Savior. Anger. Bible here finishes off. Uh, God uh, continues to talk to him there in verse 10. Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for without the, the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle? 120,000 people, the Bible says, that can't discern between their right and their left hands. It's believed that he's talking about little children. And if there's that many little children, how many people are there in that great city? Jonah, if we go back and read in the book of, I believe it's 2 Kings, we find Jonah on the scene as a prophet of God. If you do the timeline and you kind of put things together, you'll know that God was using him as, a, as his prophet. And then this here, the book of Jonah, falls after those times given to us in 2 Kings. You know what happens? We never hear from Jonah again. The danger of us of losing heart for the Lord and losing heart for his work and for what he's trying to do is this is that while He may use us for a time and He's got a job and He's got us in use, we become hard and we become angry and we become useless to Him. He has to take us, set us on the shelf, because there's nothing else He can do. We become useless. I don't know how much longer Jonah lived past this, but as best as we can tell, because Jonah lost heart for the Lord, God lost his ability to use him. And he had to set him on a shelf. And Jonah lived out the rest of his days, never being used by God again. Why? Because I want my way and not your way. Why is it that Jesus taught his disciples, when you pray, pray this way, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because we live on the earth. And our wills need to be lined up with his will so that God can use us the way he wants to use us. Because the minute that it becomes about my will and what I want, the danger becomes we get set on the shelf. We become angry, and we become useless. 
Listen, we've got to be careful. The Bible warns us that our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our hearts can be hardened in a moment's notice when I don't get my way. But if I will stay yielded to him and say, Lord, whatever you'd have me to do and do it with a heart that says, Lord, I want to please you. I want you to be happy with me. Whatever you say is fine. And even whatever is things, well, I wouldn't do it that way, Lord, but not my will, but thine be done. Please, Lord, keep me tender, keep me usable. But tonight, it's an examination for us. Are we usable for the Lord? Father, help us tonight.